Bonjour. Bonjour les amis. Bonjour et bienvenue à Paris. Coucou. Bienvenue. Thank you for joining me on this very wet, very soggy Parisian Saturday. It is 4 p.m. in Paris. We are two hours away from our curfew. I'm going to try and make the most of it to show you what I'd like to show you today. On the bright side, your feet will be staying dry. So that's great. <laughs> Very happy for you. <laughs> uh, on the bright side as well, there won't be that many people on the streets because it's been raining all day. All day, all day. Bonjour. I'm going to wait a, a minute or so. Welcome, welcome friends, bienvenue. We are in uh, a neighborhood you probably recognize in Paris in the 18th arrondissement along the boulevard de Clichy. And uh, the metro station you see in front of you, I'm going to show you the name. I'm sure many of you have uh, used this metro stop before. It's called Blanche. Blanche, which means uh, white. And that's because we are on La Place Blanche, the white square. Now, if I told you the white square, La Place Blanche, has something to do with plaster. Plaster, like the kind of uh, material sculptors use, you probably would not believe me. And yet, this is why this square has been named La Place Blanche. We are in a neighborhood that used to be known as Les Grandes Carrières, the big quarries. And a good chunk of Montmartre, of the hill actually, uh, is part of that neighborhood still. Whether you realize this or not, we are standing on a big piece of Swiss cheese. There were quarries here, some of the biggest quarries in Paris, in fact. And they were exploited for a really, really long time. It uh, started in, uh, during Gallo-Roman times. And then it went on through the Middle Ages, through the centuries. And um, gypsum was uh, what uh, the Montmartre quarries provided. And with the gypsum, they made white plaster, the Paris plaster, which was used for construction I don't know if you're aware of this, but after a big fire in London in 1666, French kings more or less prohibited Parisians from leaving wood on the facades, naked wood on the facades of medieval homes. And so they had to be whitewashed with plaster, which of course triggered all the activity or reinforced it in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods. The Paris plaster, especially the one extracted here in Montmartre, was very renowned the quality was excellent and it worked really well not just for construction to whitewash the facades as a fire retardant but also for uh, art for sculpting and therefore it was um, exported widely now i'll talk later about what that caused um i'll talk later about what that caused <laughs> somebody wants to say hello bonjour Bonjour, monsieur. <laughs> the crepe merchant, the crepe merchant must be a little cold, bless him. So yes, this plaster, those quarries were exploited and they called the square La Place Blanche, the white square, because the plaster, the quarries were on the hill. We're going to head in this direction in a few minutes. And uh, once it was made, they put it on carriages. The carriages were drawn by horses and they made their way down the hill towards Paris and they were surrounded by a big cloud, a big white cloud because of the plaster. It covered the buildings, it, I'm sure it covered people as well and that's where the name came from. So today I am taking you on another stroll in the series Paris Streetscape with Vero and for those of you who recently joined us, what I do is I take you along the street and the neighborhood around it and we talk about that street and the neighborhood then and now. And um, 
we look, of course, at Parisians around us and what they're doing. And in this neighborhood, it's always quite lively. Bienvenue, if you just joined us, if you've missed this introduction, you can go back to the replay. As soon as I come off the air, the replay will be available on Facebook and later I will upload it on my YouTube channel, Friends with Vero. And uh, just a quick note that if you enjoy watching Paris and Friends, you can go to that channel where many videos await. Not just in English, mind you. We also have video vignettes in French where you can practice your French. So head over to the YouTube channel Friends with Vero later if you want and check out what's out there. I see we have over 369 people. Construction sounds, I'm impressed, on a Saturday afternoon. So just a word about this windmill you see over there. This is, of course, the famous Moulin Rouge. Looking a little sad in the rain, looking a little sad too because it's been closed, like most cultural places, for weeks and weeks now. No movies, no movie theaters, no theaters, no shows, nothing. Paris has been really quiet since the end of the year. Le Moulin Rouge was one of the famous cabarets in this area. It's become an institution. The shows they put on now, of course, are quite professional. But a long time ago, at the end of the 19th century, it was one of the places to be in this neighborhood. And there were many just like it, but very few have survived. So I won't get any closer because of the traffic and the construction. And if you're ready, we will head on over to La Rue Le Pic that awaits. Let's try and cross the street first. It's quite busy in spite of the rain, as you can see. I know there are a lot of scammers. They have been all around the internet, hopping on live streams as soon as they can. I've blocked as many as I could. Please do not click on any of the links in the comment section, and I will make sure to block them as soon as I'm off the air. Facebook is gonna need to find a solution to this problem because it's becoming a big one. All right, let's try not to get, let's try not to get run over. I let the car go, it's bigger than me. I'm assuming the sound is good for you. You would have told me otherwise. Look at this souvenir shop. This is clearly a very touristy neighborhood or it used to be when the tourist international tourists were still around, but not, not right now. And very few tourist shops are open right now. This is one of the few you'll see on the street. Now I had photos to show you, but I wouldn't be able to take them out because I'm holding this pretty umbrella to protect my, <laughs> my head and the phone. Let's get away from this noise. We used to complain there was construction in Paris before the before COVID hit. I think it's even worse now. There's construction everywhere. You'll see uh, scaffolding everywhere we go today. Just a very loud city. But trust me, we're gonna try and find some quieter places. Now there is a song known as Rue Le Pic which I shared on Facebook. Some of you got to hear the version interpreted by a wonderful lady called Patachou, and others, my club members, got to enjoy the version by Yves Montand. And I shared these because this song is going to be our guide um, along this street. This street looks so different today in 2021 from what it looked like at the turn of the century, the heart of a very um, a working class neighborhood lined with food shops, merchants, cafes, little restaurants, working class neighborhood with people going about their day all the time, super lively. And on market days, the merchants would take out their wares on both sides of the streets. In fact, your homework after this, um, after this tour would be to Google Rue Le Pic 
and to look at all the old postcards and vintage photos for 1900 all the way to the 1960s when it was still a colorful place. And that's what the song talks about. It talks about the sounds, the smells, the tastes of La Rue Le Pic. It talks about the people who used to live here, the little children, the poor little children of the neighborhood who were known as Les Pulbo. They were, they were named after Francisque Pulbo. You know I love Francisque Pulbo, and if you don't know that, that's because you haven't seen my other videos, so head over to YouTube later, the videos I shared about Montmartre. Uh, they talk about, the song also talks about going uphill, up, up, up the hill, which is what we're going to do. And then it talks about the windmills, and we will be talking about that. So today in 2021, La Rue Le Pic has changed a lot. In fact, it's changed a lot from the days when I came here, when I lived in Paris in the mid-1980s. So if I think it's changed in over 25 years, then I can't imagine what locals must feel like. There's still food. You will find some traiteurs, the delis. Some of them are Asian traiteurs. You will find a couple of boucheries or butcher shops. But get this, I talked to a couple of locals who've been here for 20 years uh, earlier this week, and they said at one point in time, this street, which is half a mile long, had about 10 to 12 butchers, just the butchers. Incredible. There are a couple left now. So it looks like a regular neighborhood because people actually live around here. It's not just a touristy place. You have your pharmacy. The French love their pharmacies, as you know. On the right here is an institution of sorts. It's called the Lux Bar, L-U-X, Lux. And this is interesting for you to look at because you see those wooden structures. Today, I cannot point anything. I <laughs> point at anything because I'm holding the uh, umbrella in the other hand, I'm sorry. I can't zoom either. Uh, you see those uh, wooden pieces of those boards here. These are the temporary terraces that restaurants had been allowed to build last summer when Paris reopened. And um, they kind of stand neglected now because the restaurants and bars are closed. They can only open for takeout. Some of them kind of bend the rules a little bit. You can see that people are kind of hanging out outside even though they're not supposed to. It's Saturday and it's busy. And I'm sure some of you have sat out here. The Luke's Bar has been here since the early 1900s. It is a restaurant. It's a cafe as well. The terrace is always full. And yeah, you can hear the rain on my umbrella. So can I. As long as I don't feel it, it's okay. Inside this beautiful restaurant is a, is a wall, a large wall at the back with a fresco, ceramic fresco that represents the Moulin Rouge and the area. And it was made in 1910 by a very famous ceramicist at the time who ended up working with Guimard, the gentleman who did those beautiful metro entrances the Art Nouveau metro entrances, like the one we were standing by down there. So if you ever come back in this area, check out the Lux Bar. I personally enjoy sitting outside to have a glass of wine like locals used to do. A glass of red wine, though they would do it probably in the morning <laughs> before going to work, a lot of them, in the early 1900s. And um, the Ballon, it was called... Um, it was called a canon. A canon, a canon is a glass of red wine. And you would, if you enjoyed it at the zinc, at the counter, at the counter, it would be a lot cheaper, of course, than sitting in the room or sitting outside. And that's why uh, the locals would do, the people who knew, and they would hang out by the bar. And the zinc is because a lot of them had zinc tops. And this one, I believe, still does. So the Lux Bar, one of the few surviving businesses from the 20th century on the street, which is a little sad in a way. This boulangerie is not old, but there has been a boulangerie in this spot since um, the 20th century. So at least they remain faithful to the idea. What you see a lot of along La Rue Le Pic these days are clothing, is clothing and accessories. And that's a trend everywhere in Paris, in many gentrified neighborhoods. Well, I promised you some Parisian street vibes and it looks like you're going to get them anyway, in spite of the 
semi-lockdown. In spite of everything, here's another traiteur. They cook for you and you can take away dishes. We'll talk about these buildings a little later. I will point out to I will point out how in Montmartre a lot of the buildings are used to be very low one or two floors maximum you still see some of them like on the street on the left and then you have in the 19th century late 19th century they start getting a little higher the reason they did that was because those belonged to working classes and they didn't have much money also the ground was very unstable because of the quarries I talked about earlier. If you missed the introduction, you'll have to go back. What do we have here? Another chain. This one is Paul. I talked about Paul in northern France when we were in Lille a few weeks ago for uh, New Year's Eve. It was born outside in northern France outside Lille. Very reliable chain, but it's a chain. You still have a few primeurs that sell fresh produce, fruit and vegetable. Across the street is a beautiful dead end street that's private, but I'm going to try and show you through the gate how pretty it is. Still a lot of people around in spite of the rain. It's Saturday afternoon. This is called l'impasse, impasse le pic. Impasse means dead end street. You need to have access with a digicode. I don't have the digicode, but there are a lot of these places in Montmartre and in other section, the sections of Paris that used to be working class neighborhoods. Usually they go uphill in Montmartre. This one is rather flat. We will see different ones. If I turn around, you can see a cafe called Les Deux Moulins. This cafe has been here since the early 1900s. It only became Les Deux Moulins, again, a reference to windmills in the 1950s. But it became famous internationally in 2001 when a movie came out called Amélie. Out abroad it was called Amélie. The title was much longer in French with the delightful actress Audrey Totou. And he told the story of a young waitress who works in this cafe and observes life around her. It was extremely cute. And a lot of people fell in Montmartre all over again, or for the first time after watching the movie. And a couple of locals I was uh, talking to this week said that they were partly blaming the movie for bringing in a different set of people here, people who were interested in living the Amélie dream and have a picture-perfect Montmartre and could afford it because of course prices had gone up tremendously. So you can see this cafe is doing the exact same thing as the other one. It's, uh, it's not supposed, people are really not supposed to stand outside in groups the way they're doing. And they are because it's raining and they're trying to get, uh, to stay protected from the rain and they can do takeout, so they're doing it. And this is what those temporary terrace that they set up last summer with the blessing of the City Hall of Paris look like nowadays when they've been completely abandoned since restaurants and cafes have been closed for weeks. So the street still has a lot of Montmartre vibes, fortunately. You see those lower buildings, this one has three floors. So picture a village outside Paris early on. Montmartre was not part of Paris until the 1860s when, like many other villages, it was annexed by Napoleon III during the Second Empire. Until then, it was out, it sat outside Paris. It was a peaceful little village, quite rural. You wouldn't have seen any of these buildings then. Here is one of the butcher shops I was talking to you about. Picture the street with 10 or 12 of them. Now there's only two. La Boucherie des Gourmets. And what's left in the rotisserie window, not much is left. Because it's the afternoon, it's the end of the day, really. And so just a few set of potatoes left. Uh, I don't know if you see them with the reflection, but it's crazy. So I would have gotten closer to Les Deux Moulins to show you their menu, but uh, I think I would bother these people with my umbrella and I'm not going to do that. We have more shops, more food shops. 
in the tradition of this street, we have a wine merchant, a caviste. We have une fromagerie, a cheesemonger. You have to have une fromagerie. And apparently they have a really nice selection of goat cheese. That's what just caught my eye. Look at that. If you've just joined us, welcome. I am taking you along the Rue Peak in Montmartre in the 18th arrondissement of Paris. And we are talking about La Rue Le Pic and Montmartre then and now and kind of making comparisons and drawing, making connections between the present and the past to see what's happened to this neighborhood. Here is a rotisserie. So their specialty is really roasted meat. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Ça va? Coucou. <laughs> So what I'd like to do, I think, is cross the street, if I can, with all these motorcycles. So this is not your standard, just a heads up, this is not your standard Montmartre visit. I know many of you have already come here. I know many of you have already visited Montmartre and seen the landmarks. What I'm trying to do instead is capture the face of Montmartre that you don't see every day and understand what the magic of Montmartre is. And for this, I'm going to leave the Rue Le Pic for a few seconds and go into the Rue Constance. Ah, peace and quiet. This is nice. And I'm walking in the middle of the street, which I'm not supposed to do. Sorry, but then I'll do it again because it's nicer. Only the best for us on a rainy day. Am I right? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Véronique. My friends call me Véro. I will introduce myself briefly if I can drop off my umbrella. It's hard to do. In fact, I'll do it right here because I have some protection here. So let's see. Voila, my friends, this is me. Bonjour, <laughs> nice to see you. Véronique Véro, like I was saying, I am a Paris-based uh, multitasker, a virtual tour guide, a French language instructor, and a long-time travel blogger. And uh, France with Véro is my home. And your home as well. You're all invited daily on social media, Facebook, Instagram, on my YouTube channel, where many videos await. And I do those uh, live calls when I can, sharing Paris, but also the rest of France. So today we are in Montmartre and I hope you're enjoying the stroll. Ooh, I think I pushed the wrong button. Doesn't matter. Look at this nice sign on this uh, shoe store. See the boot? I'm gonna do this so we can walk next to it. There's a really nice little shop sign. They used to do this in the Middle Ages. You'd have signs outside shops so people would know what's there. Thank you for joining us. I see we have 479 people. Goodness me. These are really nice shoes, by the way. Thank you for the kind comments and the support. I considered, I'll be honest, I did consider canceling the tour when I saw the rain was not going to let up at all. But then I figured I lived in Seattle for two decades and I learned to go about my day with or without rain and I'll do the same with a good umbrella. You'll see in a second why I brought you here off La Rue Le Pic in La Rue Constance. You'll have to come back. When you come back to Paris, you'll have to return here on a pretty day. It'll be much nicer. You see this brocante? I'll go back to that. And you see examples here of some of the lower buildings that I was mentioning that used to be the norm in the village of Montmartre. Look at this beautiful one. It's covered. I thought it was Boston Ivy when I stopped by this week, but in fact, it's a vine and there are dried grapes on it on the side. So I think they're making wine off of that wall. 
Look at this beautiful building on the, on the right there with the bow windows. Probably added in the very late 19th century or early, probably 19th century. That's when they liked the bow windows, second half of the 19th century. But what I came to show you is this here by the Brocante, which is closed today. Look, so this is funny. Looks what we have. You never know what you're going to find in Paris. We actually have a unicorn. We have a unicorn right there. And other magical creatures, including, I don't know how magical it is, a snail. A big snail, or maybe it's a slug. I just mentioned Seattle after all. A land of the banana slug. So, what's cool in Paris is that you have... Allez-y, allez-y, pas de problème. Bonne journée, madame. What you have in Paris is signs. Well, this one's been tagged, unfortunately, but you have signs that tell you about where you are. And this is the impasse Marie Blanche. Impasse is a word that means a dead end. And um, my American friends call this a cul-de-sac. That's because they don't always know that cul-de-sac means the arse of a bag. I think it's nicer to say dead end personally. But in this impasse, something really interesting happened. And if you read this whole sign, it tells you about a gentleman, the Comte de l'Escalopier, who in the very early 19th century came here and bought himself or built himself a beautiful private mansion. They used to call them Hôtel Particulier. And decades later, it was torn down and a gentleman took over. And back then, in the second half of the 19th century, we've talked about that on other walks, there was this revival, this Gothic revival, where people really loved the past and the Middle Ages. So affluent people would have houses built in the troubadour style, which was very Gothic. So the second gentleman who actually made furniture built himself a giant house. So nothing is left of the original one, but he did get some of the details around the windows and we cannot get any closer because again, you can see the gate, the digicode, it's private. But there was a square tower, do you see the tower? So this was built in kind of a Gothic style, very interesting place. So today people live there. They probably turned it into apartments. I'm not quite sure about the house itself. But next to it are some really pretty homes and these really capture the flavor of the old Montmartre. Do you see how much lower the buildings are on the right-hand side? One, two or three floors. This is how everything was built around here. So let's get closer to this Gothic mansion. We might be able to peek at something. I won't be peeking at anything personally because I'm not wearing my glasses because of the, <laughs> of the fog. So you can see some details, but not too many. We'd have to, you can actually Google it. I think you can find some photos of it online. So picture this gentleman who built this first home here. And then another guy comes with money in the second half of the 19th century. At one point in town, at one point in time outside the first home, there was a giant greenhouse heated with steam. Maybe it was the second home, actually. That would make more sense. And uh, then the greenhouses were replaced by books, an extensive library of books. So it was kind of a quirky place, you can tell. I like this view. That's why I walked all the way back here. I, I was here earlier and I, uh, this week, and I really enjoyed this view because when you turn around after seeing this Gothic home in the troubadour style or peeking at it, you see exactly what Montmartre used to look like. Bonjour. And you see how much lower the buildings are? And then of course you have your cobalt stones. And this I think is the magic of Montmartre is that even in a very touristy neighborhood like this, usually crowded, very crowded, right off of a very busy street like La Rue Le Pic, if you take a chance, make a left or a right and explore, you can still find beautiful places.
I bet this facade looks amazing in the in the spring and even better in the fall when that vine I can see you probably cannot see that but there are little dried little grapes on the vine and you have street art this is part of life in Paris these days a lot of street art So we're gonna go back to La Rue Le Pic. And I'm doing uh, what the series is all about, following a main street, La Rue Le Pic, and then taking peaks left and right at the neighborhood around it. And we are about to leave the busiest part of the, of the street. The rain isn't that bad. It's not very hard rain. It's steady, but it's not bad. Here's the shop again with the boot. I see a lot of you have turned up. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Veronique Vero. I did introduce myself earlier. You'll have to go to the replay if you want to see what I look like with a face mask on. Not sure we're gonna be doing without the face mask today since my hands are full. Something I want to show you is what happens to a neighborhood like Montmartre when uh, the neighborhood starts growing, getting more and more popular. Remember we said it was always a working class neighborhood, very humble neighborhood, very poor neighborhood in fact. But then in the late 19th century, early 20th, it becomes trendier and trendier once it's back, once it's part of Paris and the 18th arrondissement. And the bourgeois come here. And of course they can't live in those tiny little village homes I showed you with only two floors. So they have those interesting looking buildings erected, very late 19th century. And this is the time known as Art Nouveau. And the style in Montmartre is quite eclectic. So you will see very different structures but it's interesting after seeing that little street we went to, to see what starts to pop up in the neighborhood roughly in the late 19th century and early 20th. And we are headed to a part of the neighborhood where you'll see more of that. Now, of course, it wouldn't be Paris if we didn't have traffic, traffic jams. This is not a good neighborhood to have a car probably one of the worst in Paris. So what we could do is look back. Oh, pardon. We could look back at where we came from. So it's not as lively as it normally would be with the rain, but I mean, you can still, you can still, you can still see that there are lots of people around. Usually standing by the cafes, the couple of cafes, and my goodness, this place Early 20th century, 1900s, there were many cafes, there were cabarets. There was a jazz bar in the street. And now they have a couple of cafes left. Another little market here. Jeff de Bruges, which is chocolates from Belgium, but of course it's also a chain. And here's on the left, the Parisian institution. I need to step back so you can see it. Turn around. A la mère de famille. Institution. This has been a family business. It was a family business for generations and generations. It appeared in the 18th century. It's a chocolate, it's a chocolate place. It's still owned by a family, but not the same family that started it. They make their own products. Their chocolate is excellent. The packaging is lovely. La Mère de Famille. And you probably know it because the original store uh, is on Rue du Faubourg Montmartre in the 9th arrondissement. I took you on a stroll in the 9th arrondissement last June and it's on my YouTube channel and you will see the original store. It's a beautiful window but some of their specialties are here. And they make their chocolates from cocoa beans, so the whole process, they don't cheat. Now, two years ago, they announced their partnership with another iconic French brand, which is known as Storer. Do 
you see the name on that box? Storer. Both brands were born in the 18th century. Storer was the pastry chef of Louis XV in Versailles and his wife, Queen Mary Lezinska. And he started a little boutique, which is today Rue Montorgueil, the beautiful Rue Montorgueil with lots of food in uh, near Les Halles. She doesn't want me to film. I'm not filming her, I'm just filming the window. The French are very picky with that. You have to be careful. I was going to show you some of the pastries, but the window was almost empty anyway. Les Petits Mitrons is a lovely shop. I'm going to try and show you what they have. It's more of a newer business. It's a... Uh, Les Petits Mitrons, it's called. You see it with the blue awning right there? Mitron is a young child, a young boy who works in a pâtisserie or a boulangerie. Let's go this way. It's hard to get through. And the rain is really falling now, do you see? See, he has his uh, produce outside, outside his store and this is exactly what they did in the 1900s and all the way through the 1960s. On market days, they would take out the food so that the street was really lined with uh, food a lot. So this is kind of traditional for them to do that, actually. I'm glad some of them are still doing that. So this is Les Petits Mitrons, which advertises Les Tartes Salées, the savory tarts, or Les Tartes Sucrées, the sweet tarts. And I mean, would you look at these? Made with fruit the artisanal way. How would you like one of these? They range in price from 16 to 18 euros and they probably serve four to six people. They also make their own cookies. So this is called Les Petits Mitrons if you ever come to this neighborhood and it's always busy. Next to it is a business I really like. It's called L'Epicerie du Terroir. It's a grocery store that, say, that sells fine products. And you can really go on a tour de France. Coucou! <laughs> Here's the owner, Eric. I was going to take you inside, but I thought it would take too much time. So what I'm going to do is come back because Eric said I could film in his store and show you some of the products here. Ça va, Eric? Ça va, ça va? Il pleut, il mouille. C'est la fête à la grenouille. <laughs> on est gâté, hein? Ah, on est gâté. <laughs> Je reviens la semaine prochaine. À bientôt, à bientôt, Eric. He's a lovely man. We had a really nice chat about the neighborhood. They've been here for about 15 years now. And he saw the neighborhood change. He told me lots of stories. And his store sits in a former, this was one of the butcher shops, the boucherie. You can see the old name of the owner, Monsieur Benard. So they've left the outside of the store. And he said it was a store for um, a butcher for about 50 years. And then it was briefly a florist. And then they bought it and turned it into this uh, gourmet uh, grocery store. And they've been doing okay uh, without the tourists because locals buy a lot from them during the confinement and their products are wonderful. So I will probably come back and shoot a video inside the store if he'll let me, I think he will. So we reached the top of La Rue Le Pic now. I need to keep an eye on the time. Okay. And I told you that the stroll is, I go basically from one end, I don't know if I've said that, but I'll say it now. <laughs> I go from one end of the Rue Le Pic to the other end, half a mile. And we see a few things along the way. Here is a poissonnerie a fishmonger, a beautiful one. So this one keeps the tradition alive as well. Beautiful store. And the rain is ramping up, I think. Look at the beautiful Coquille Saint-Jacques. Coquille Saint-Jacques, the scallops. Bonjour, madame. We are at the corner of La Rue Le Pic and La Rue des Abbes. Another very busy street that's changed a lot, but still a fun street, restaurants, cafes, and of course the 
clothing stores that you see everywhere in Paris now, some of them being chains. I'm going to go in this direction because this is what Rue Le Pic does and what Rue Le Pic does, I'm doing today. And we're gonna go uphill and we will wrap up the stroll at the end of the Rue Le Pic. If I followed this little street, which is called Rue Joseph de Mestre, quite an unusual setup. It looks like Rue Le Pic is splitting a little bit. This would take us right down there at the beautiful Montmartre Cemetery. And uh, there are three cemeteries in Montmartre. I've taken you on video tours to two of them. Again, head back to my YouTube channel to see these. The Montmartre Cemetery is wonderful, beautiful place, very unique layout. And the reason for that is because it was one of those former gypsum quarries trying not to get run over. One of the former gypsum quarries in Montmartre. So if you want to picture the terrain of a former quarry, head over to the Cimetière de Montmartre and you will see. All right, I'm going now or I'll never go. More food along the side, an award-winning boulangerie that apparently makes a really good baguette. Another empty terrace, abandoned because the restaurant is closed and has opted not to do takeout. This was an iconic restaurant in Montmartre, La Pomponette. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Vous restez au sec. Au revoir. <laughs> and uh, La Pomponette was really an iconic restaurant. It had a red awning and it opened in the 1900s. Was here all that time run by the same family. And then last year they announced they were selling and nobody understood and people were crushed that it was leaving after all these years. On the walls, you could see illustrations and paintings left by actors, uh, sorry, by artists who couldn't pay their bills. And now Bibiche is a brand new restaurant and that poor Bibiche, which is a cute little affectionate name, poor Bibiche has actually opened, I think they opened right before COVID hit. So here we go, walking uphill now following La Rue Le Pic, it's going to be much, much quieter. All the restaurants you will see are probably closed. And keep in mind that back in the 1960s still, along this part of the street, you had food stores as well. It wasn't as quiet as it is today. And in some of the newer shops, they have kept the facades of these old stores. The wind's picking up, not good. Now you know that Montmartre, of course, is famous for its, for being a haven for artists. They started flocking here in the 1870s, once the cute little village, or the poor little village, in fact, had been incorporated into the city. And many, many, many came here. Some were actually born here and raised here. One of them was Maurice Utrillo, the painter, the painter. One of the few who was born and, uh, born and raised here and painted the streets, including the Rue Le Pic. Utrillo, if you want to see what the neighborhood looked like, is a great painter to look up. But in this uh, building here, number 54, the blue door, is where Vincent van Gogh spent two years of his life living with his brother Theo, I believe it was the third floor, possibly the fourth. He did a beautiful painting from that window up there uh, called a window from a uh, view from the window or ruler peak from the window or something like that. But it, he painted ruler peak. I can't translate it right. I'm sorry. Anyway, Vincent spent two years here. He had just arrived from the Netherlands and that was before he headed to southern France where he was so uh, where he worked so hard and in this neighborhood he really found his style he made friends like Gauguin uh, Toulouse Lautrec he also spent a lot of time alone and because the apartment was so small he did what a lot of Parisians do he spent a lot of time outside every day uh, in the outdoors starting painting representing and picture this neighborhood I mean there weren't that many buildings at the time there were still a lot of fields and windmills and Vincent painted all that he painted the people in the cabarets he wasn't a he didn't paint that many people, but he loved, he loved landscapes, as you know. Anyway, I just wanted to point out the house where he lived. Many, many more artists, of course, lived in this uh, 
in the street. In fact, the gentleman who wrote the song Rue Le Pic lived right along here somewhere. If you look up the artist who lived in Montmartre and worked in Montmartre and including along the Rue Le Pic, the list is very long. Some of them you probably won't recognize. They were French, uh, they were authors, they were painters, they were movie makers like Claude Autant Lara. I mean, so many of them. This neighborhood has always attracted artists because it was cheap and because there was a vibe here. There was a joie de vivre. And with the artists came all the cabarets, the cabarets, the fun places. And that's how all of that was born. I'm sorry, I'm not picking up on your comments. The reason is I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> and as you know, I'm flying a little blind here. So, this street is really schizophrenic, isn't it? On the right-hand side, you see, in spite of the added floors, you kind of see the old Montmartre and the smaller buildings that used to be there in sections, like over there. And then on the left-hand side, merci, on the left-hand side, you have the beautiful stately buildings that were erected much, much later in the late 19th century and early 20th for the bourgeois I told you about when prices of real estate really went up and the neighborhood started changing. Now, the problem is when that happened, they had to destroy a lot of these old homes. And most, something else they had to destroy were the windmills. Montmartre had about 13 windmills, 13 windmills, and a lot of them were lining up the street. I had a photo to show you, maybe I'll post it on Facebook later, of the street lined with windmills. Little by little, they were all taken down until a couple remained. And you might think that these windmills were used just to uh, crush cereal or wheat, for example, when in fact they were used for a lot of things. They crushed plaster, they crushed um, pebbles for glass makers, they crushed grapes to make cheap wine. These windmills were really used a lot from the 16th century, in fact, from the Renaissance all the way to the mid 19th century. And what brought them down, of course, was industrialization, the Industrial Revolution. You see, look at that, this is really cool. You have, you can kind of picture the old Montmartre if this was a little lower. And across from it is this beautiful row or alignment of buildings. And the street seems to curve. The building seems to curve with the street. Isn't that pretty? And we are still walking along Rue Le Pic. Now, some of the windmills that are now gone used to sit up on the hill. Got lots of wind here. They were happy here and working really well. And the windmills are gone, but sometimes you see those passages, those private, a lot of them are private. And this is what Montmartre really, we'll see one in a minute. A lot of these acts, you yeah, see, this is private here. I'm going to show you another one that's better right there. Coming up on our left is big flight of stairs. And that's what Montmartre is famous for. And a very exclusive hotel, Hotel Particulier Montmartre, sits there in a beautiful home uh, that was built in the late 19th century. It's probably the smallest hotel in Paris. I think they have five exclusive suites. And it's so private and quiet that celebrities like to come here and stay. They also have a bar and a restaurant. You can come for a drink or have brunch too. But if you come, you have to buzz them because the access is closed. And see, here is their sign. Hotel Particulier Montmartre. Uh, don't worry about me. I'll make it. Look at that. And this is pure Montmartre, pure Montmartre vibes. And on the right hand side at the top of those stairs is that hotel in the middle of a beautiful garden and more private buildings on the left. So the whole street is, is private. 
you need to have a code to get in or you need to buzz the hotel. And right now only the hotel is open and I think they're doing construction. What is this? Something new. L'élève de Montmartre. The pupil of Montmartre. Not sure what's going to happen here. I'm impressed that some people are still opening businesses right now. Well, then again, so many are closing. It is raining. <laughs> Eha! I like this view here on the side of the street. It's quite pretty. Beautiful building at the very end on the right. You had, you had a lot of uh, artist workshops around here, so it's not unusual to see big windows, you see, that bring in the light. Welcome, if you just joined us, we are walking along the iconic street in Montmartre, Rue Le Pic. We are now in the second half of the stroll, and we will be wrapping up at the end of the street, but not before we see a couple of local institutions which are coming up trying to keep my phone dry i don't know if i'm doing a very good job it's gonna be a good test for the old iphone so windmills may be gone with a couple of exceptions but they're still remembered everywhere you see this uh, bar and restaurant here autour du moulin around the windmill it's the name and here is a pretty street i'm going to turn around first so you can see the shape allez-y madame merci beaucoup so you can see the shape of the rue le pic as those buildings on the right hand side over there kind of curve with the street see we've been climbing this this is i'm going to stand here maybe the famous Rue Tolosé. And in fact, if you kept going, you would reach La Rue Le Pic because we went in a loop. We, we, it kind of curves around. So if I went all the way down, I could reach it where we came from. There's a movie theater on the left down there that's been here since the 1930s. An independent one. Uh, cinephiles really love this place. There's a chocolate shop that's really good way down the street too and quite a few little restaurants, La Rue Tolosé. And of course, a lot of people look up La Rue Tolosé like we're going to do now, because if you look up, you see a sign, Moulin de la Galette, and you see a windmill. I told you there were a couple surviving. So today, this is private. You cannot get up there unless you live in some of these buildings here or there. This windmill, and the one next to it we will see last is called the Blut Fin. This windmill, my friends, was born at the... So the connection, we had people with their phones working next to me and I noticed the crowd, so I moved around. I'm gonna try and show you the Blut Fin again. There we go, we're back. The Blut Fin right here. This windmill has actually... It was born at the beginning of the 17th century when Louis XIII was king, imagine that. So of course it's been worked on, but I mean, do you see how old it is? And all its life, it's only crushed wheat or rye. And with the one we'll see next, it belonged to a family of millers, the Debré family, who were quite entrepreneurial. And before Montmartre even became part of Paris, when it was still a village outside Paris, they started welcoming Parisians who wanted to come to the countryside, get some fresh air, I guess, when this was still pretty rural. And they offered them some galette, little pancakes made of rye, and they served them with milk at first and then with wine. So they opened a ganget. Ganget is a restaurant where you can come have fun and dance. And the ganget was right there, a little bit higher on the left, where the other windmill is. 60 years later, the same family opened a second fun place right here right outside this windmill there was a big structure a big building you can still look it up online and it became known as le bal du moulin de la galette le bal the ball b-a-l so people came here and danced and that was the end of the 19th century and those bal were everywhere in fact 
one of the famous ones was the Moulin Rouge before it became what it is today. So imagine people lining up in the street. They would have lined up right here. You can find photos online still. Through the 1920s, through the 1930s, people came here to dance and have fun. Eventually in the 60s, Le Bal du Moulin de la Galette became a TV studio and they filmed shows here. And then eventually it closed down and it became a private property for the people who live around here. So I'm going to take you now to the other Moulin, the Debray family, the Millers. Their story is a little bit tragic, but they have, they have been part of the story of Montmartre for years. And they own those two windmills. The one we just saw never moved. It was always there from the early 1600s. The second one is called Le Moulin Radé, R-A-D-E-T. That one they did move a little bit because it used to sit a little higher on the street. And they brought it down here on their property. They had a farm, they had a garden, they had the two windmills. And like I said, they were very entrepreneurial and very clever at capitalizing on this interest that people had in Paris and later the artists. And of course, the Moulin de la Galette has been painted by so many artists. Van Gogh did it, Utrillo, Renoir in a famous painting. So I'm going to turn around. Thank you for sticking with me on a very soggy Parisian stroll. I'll look back so you can see the other windmill. Voila! So when people say Le Moulin de la Galette, they often refer to this restaurant with the other windmill, which actually sat up the street over there until they moved it down here. This one actually works, I believe. And it was saved by a local association when they wanted to take it down. So the story of this restaurant is that originally, like I said, in the first half of the 19th century, it was a ganguette, a fun restaurant with music owned by the Debray family. Later on, it became an Italian restaurant. And when it was an Italian restaurant, there was a, a lady who lived in this area who came here all the time. Here is the Rue d'Orchamps. The Rue d'Orchamps has the narrowest sidewalks in Paris, I've heard. And at the very end on the street, on the right-hand side behind that little wall, a famous artist named Dalida used to live. She uh, was Italian, but was born in Egypt and became famous in France and all over Europe, had a wonderful career for decades, glorious lady, beautiful, wonderful performer. Unfortunately, her personal life was very sad and she ended up committing suicide in the second half of the 80s, 1987, I believe. Her house behind that wall over there, nobody can buy or turn into a museum because it's already been subdivided into private apartments. But when she lived here, Dalida would walk up the street. See, she'd just come out here. She'd walk up the street and she'd go straight into the Italian restaurant that was here where she had a table that you can still sit at if you see. They have the Dalida table. And eventually the restaurant became more of a, I'd say it's a little bit of a fancier restaurant now, uh, Le Moulin de la Galette, but you can still have a decent uh, two or three course meal for around 30 euros and the food is quite good. So we are almost at the end of Rue Le Pic. I hope you're enjoying this very soggy stroll. I am in spite of the weather. If you'd like to see more strolls like this one and enjoy the content I share daily on Facebook, Instagram, and what I post on YouTube, I'd love you to consider becoming a, me a member of the Friends with Vero Club. You have different levels of uh, memberships. By doing this, you help me. This is my job now. You help me create more content that everybody enjoys, but you also get treated to a lot of exclusive contents. For example, after this walk, my club members will get to see behind the scenes photos I've taken this week of this area, the things I haven't shown you because I didn't have time. They will also get treated to more fun stuff next week. I'm saving a little surprise for them. So you can join us on Patreon, patreon.com French slash French girl in Seattle. The most popular program, a tier, I should say, in the program is called a flanner. And you can get in for the cost of two 
lattes a month. You can stop it at any time and you will enjoy Paris and friends throughout the week on top of what I share on social media. Along the end of the Rue Le Pic, you have art galleries. Some of them are closed, of course, because nobody's here right now. Le Bon, La Butte, clever play on word. La Butte, B-U-T-T-E, -T -T -E, means the hill, and that is what the section of Montmartre is referred to. But it's also based on the name of a famous movie from the 60s called Le Bon, La, Butte, La Brute et le Truant. We had uh, well-known French authors living around here, like Céline, Courteline, and I believe one of them lived in one of these houses. Personally, I'd be very happy living in this little house here. What do you think? See, behind the gate, you even have a, a garage for your car. Unusual, unusual, unusual. Ah, the lights are coming on, so now we get to see a little bit and see the old Moulin Radé. It was born a hundred years later than the other one. The first one was born in the early 17th century. Le Moulin Radé, this one was born in the 18th century. But you know what? It never actually crushed weed or rye like its friend. This one was safe to crush uh, flower bulbs for the perfume industry. I told you they did a lot of things with the windmills. And here is a business that's been closed because of everything being closed. It says La Cave de Gaston Leroux, auteur du Fantôme de l'Opéra. So La Cave, the cellar, Gaston Leroux, this name may sound familiar, French author who wrote a lot of uh, mystery stories. His most famous story is, of course, Le Fantôme de l'Opéra, the Phantom of the Opera. And this business has a very interesting story, too bad it's closed. One of his descendants opened this just a few years ago. She turned it into a wine bar, so, you know, in line with the times, that's what people like now, and a restaurant. But she also turned it into a little museum dedicated to her ancestor, Gaston Leroux. Lots of fun little objects. It's like going into a brocante. So when, we, when it reopens, make sure to visit it. Another gallery art gallery and you can see its name La Galerie des Moulins, the gallery of the windmills. So impossible to forget about the past here. Impossible to forget about those windmills because they're mentioned everywhere, even though only a couple remain. I try to finish my strolls on at a scenic place, but it's not going to be the case today because this is where the street ends. <laughs> it would look a little prettier in the summer possibly. I'll try and find a nice background to say goodbye to you. This is a square called La Place Jean-Baptiste Clément, and it's named after a gentleman. He was not born here, but he was very active here. He was born out of money, but interestingly became very interested in politics, always fought for the poor. And if you've heard of the Commune uprising in uh, 1871 in Paris, Jean-Baptiste Clément, was uh, took really part in that uprising, which turned out to be extremely bloody. It was called the Bloody Week in May of 1871. A lot of the communards, the people who rebelled against the authorities, it's a long story, I'm not going to tell you the story of the commune today, but know that a lot of the fighting occurred here in Montmartre and that the people, like in Belleville, another neighborhood not too far from here, the people were really fighting hard. And Jean-Baptiste Clément had to run, run away he was sentenced to death and had to run away. Unfortunately, a lot of the communards were not as lucky as he was. They were executed. Their bodies were tossed into mass graves that were actually the old quarries of Montmartre. And um, Clément was able to return from exile. He actually <laughs> became a mayor for a few years uh, before he died. Uh, he's remembered for a song. He was a chansonnier. Montmartre has a history of chansonniers, those people who sang in cabarets, but their songs were more like skits and they, they had a lot of, uh, you know, they, 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 the, the lyrics were really the most important part because they, um, I'm looking for the word satire. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so 
His songs are not remembered except for one that he wrote called Le Temps des Cerises, The Time of the Cherries. Very sad, nostalgic song that he wrote before the Commune Uprising. But that song somehow became kind of the symbol of the fighting, not just in France, but in other countries, whenever working classes rebelled against the power in the power that be. So Le Temps des Cerises was popularized by Yves Montand, singer Yves Montand in the 50s, and you can look it up online. And so here on the square, Jean-Baptiste Clément and those who fought during La Commune, Les Communards, are remembered. It's a beautiful song. So voila, little friends. We have reached the end of Rue Le Pic, like I promised. Not the most scenic sight, so I will stand right here if I try to switch the camera. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this without dropping my phone. We need skills today, I'm telling you this. Voila! Ta-da! Ta-da! Is it decent? Well, you can't see a thing because of my umbrella. Well, anyway, I just wanted to say goodbye. I wanted to say thank you for following this walk in the rain. Whoa, 520 people. This is amazing. Thank you so much for staying until the end. Those of you who missed the beginning where I explained some important things about the neighborhood can go back to the replay, which we post as soon as I'm off the air. And um, let me see if I can take off my... Hold on. Hold on. I'm suffocating here. Ah! Sorry, that wasn't very nicely done. <laughs> uh, whew, breathing again. So I just want to say goodbye to you. Thank you for being here today. And if you've enjoyed this stroll, I have a virtual tip jar on PayPal. So contributions, uh, your contributions are of course gratefully accepted and they go towards the time that I spend preparing for this stroll. So thank you again for being here. Next week, there will not be a public stroll because I will be live streaming exclusively for my club members. They will even get to vote for the neighborhood and we will do that next week. Ah, I'm not filming very well. Um, so I will see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, the club members will choose where they want to go next week and I'm doing this to thank them for supporting me, for supporting my creative endeavors. So thanks friends. Uh, thank you very much. I will see you again very, very soon. A bientôt.